Hi everybody, this is Brian O'Haran on September 2nd, 2009. I want to repeat right up front here, uh, sociolo uh, my sociology class when I was in university. I went into a sociology class and they said, uh, there were about 30 students in the classroom all over the country. I was in the Midwest, I went to Kansas University. And uh, when I got in there, the, uh, the professor said, let's go around the 30 people and ask them to comment on each person. So when they got to Brian O'Haran, somebody said, we don't like you, Brian. You don't look too encouraging because your nose is too big. And uh, I knew my nose was too big, so that didn't bother me too much. Then they said, and your cheeks are fat. And I said, well, I know that. I get that from my Maltese heritage. And then they said, and your ears are too big. And I said, well, I'm not so sure I knew that my ears were too big. That worries me a bit. And then the next person said, and one ear is bigger than the other ear. And uh, the next person said, and your hairline is too high. And another person said, and your Adam's apple is too big. And your eyes should be brown instead of blue. And we went around the 30 people, and by the time I got done, as did the other students when they got done getting their criticism, we were all as nervous cats on a hot tin roof because we found out that people perceived us a lot different than we perceived ourselves. It was a great lesson in life. Not all was uh, uh, true and not all was uh, taken uh, as seriously as some of the comments, but uh, we did see how these people in the room that we had never met before saw us. Now, when these people uh, running for a candidate for office, board of selectmen, board of education, or any other office, town clerk, constable, they open themselves up to observation because they're asking to spend our tax money, our hard-earned tax money, and to run our business that we all, we the taxpayers, all own a part of. So they're also subject to scrutiny. And we will be scrutinizing them from all angles between now and uh, the election on November 3rd. Now, nobody should take this personal. These aren't personal. We didn't ask them to run for these offices. They're, they volunteered, and some are pushing hard because they're kind of e egotistical. But basically, we didn't ask them to run. Uh, maybe we did offline. Some people asked people to run. But basically... They want to run, win, and run our town. So we as taxpayers have the right to scrutinize them very closely and make sure that we want them to run their town, that we think they have the skills to run this town, and that they can help us get across the finish line perhaps faster, faster than other people in the race. I have now confirmed this time slot, 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights, for the next 13 weeks. I will use it up 
to and including Wednesday, October 28, 2009. All of the parties have one or more, and their supporters, have one or more programs scheduled right up until the election. So there's, you'll have no want for, uh, for programs. Most of them will be on Thursdays and Fridays. Some will be on Mondays and Tuesdays. Mine will be on Wednesday. I think David LaPointe might be on on Wednesday as well. So uh, there's plenty for you to see, and you can hear all the viewpoints. You can see all the people in action, and then you can make up your own mind on Election Day. I will have one Highland Lake special closer to the election, and on the last program, we'll host a meeting of all candidates that I recommend for selectmen and Board of Education. Anybody who cares to participate can, and if they don't want to participate, that's okay too. Now, we all know from this program that trust is earned. This last group of selectmen is earning our trust. Same with the town manager. They've done a lot in the last two years to earn our trust, and I wish them well in the next election. The last administration, however, did not earn our trust. And they were voted out in the last election, and the minority was voted into a, a minority position and one political party, the Winchester Party, was voted into extinction. As you know by now, I am one of the 3,700 or so unaffiliated voters in town. As a trained systems analyst and successful experienced business executive, I have been studying the financial, the management, and the political aspects of the town of Winchester for five years, and I have earned a lot of people's trust, so they tell me. Now, uh, we have produced many documents to boards and commissions about the shape that we are in and suggestions for improvement. I know more than I ever wanted to know about the town of Winchester. My widely distributed green papers of June 2006 included a rough illustrative set of business objectives for transforming the town financially and productively, productively in a positive manner. I have spent almost two years on this channel in a weekly basis trying to educate and explain my reasoning as well as pass on examples from my experience and that of those from whom we have all learned. After the last election, I promised this audience and others that I would continue this program for two years in an attempt to coach people through the coming election based upon my own past experience and what I've learned about the town of Winchester and written about over the last five years. I did this because I firmly believe that you have the right contingent of people in the majority on the Board of Selectmen and a competent town manager to manage this town out of the doldrums that it currently finds itself in. A major change in management, especially to an opposite management philosophy, would set us back inordinately. Halfway through the two years, as you all know, we were presented with the most devastating recession since the Great Depression. And like most towns, we were not prepared to weather the storm financially without tightening our belts and soldiering it out until prosperity returns, if ever. The new majority of selectmen and town manager have brought us much progress towards our short and long-term goals despite much political nonsense and political posturing from those of an opposite philosophy. The losers of the last election and the death of one of their parties. And serious injury to both of their platforms, as well as the attempt to kill the goose that could eventually lay the golden egg 
the major developments along the Enterprise Corridor between Winston and Torrington that are still seeking approval for their Army Corps of Engineer and Department of Environmental Protection at the state and federal level. The majority of the Board of Selectmen and the new town manager, as promised, have managed to keep this dream alive. They are earning your trust until the developer obtains the necessary approvals and the recession abates, if ever. The new majority has also, as promised, killed the Democrats' attempt at a big bond issue that would have meant a large increase in taxes for a 20-year period for the existing taxpayers of this town already under stress and duress. We have been fortunate to have a majority of the Board of Selectmen contingent on the, uh, that responded quickly to the taxpayers overwhelmingly demanding for the two consecutive zero tax increase budgets. Tonight and until the election, I will continue to discuss the importance of obtaining a quantum leap in profitable recurring residential development in addition to need to, uh, for the need to keep our existing industrial profitable recurring tax base while expanding it as rapidly as practical. That's what the EDC is trying to do. And the dangers in relying on small residential development, residential growth, and grand plans like the POCD and the downtown redevelopment plan to solve our financial problems. The POCD and downtown redevelopment plan are essential for the long run, but they are not going to solve our economic problems in the next five to ten years. The existing majority of the Board of Selectmen and the new town manager has done well to turn the tide. I will put forward a list of those running for the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education that I, with my experience, probably more than all the other candidates put together in selecting executives for worldwide businesses, I will put together a list that I think will help us to obtain financial balance while supplying the town's wants and needs, and I encourage you to vote for them. The rest is up to you. You can lead a voter to water, but you cannot make a voter drink. Now I will go to the agenda for tonight. You've heard the comments. There's time remaining until the November election. I will talk about that tonight. I missed it last week. The Independent Party election nominations and cross-endorsement. The marijuana clip, reprise. I didn't get a chance to reprise it last week. I'll reprise it now, perhaps even more in the future. Plus, I have new news about the marijuana from the New York Times book review this week that I'll be discussing tonight. And uh, then I'm going to go on to some positive things that are happening uh, in, in locally with developments for condos and for rental uh, apartments and rental uh, units. I'll be discussing that tonight because my viewpoint there is these are good for the town and I'll explain uh, one or two reasons for that. Very good for the town. I encourage them and everybody should continue with those but they're not going to solve our financial problem for us. Um, they probably might even cost us more than uh, they help. The election day, November 3rd, 2009. Days to election, 62. Weeks to election, 9. Months to election, 2. Final, final weekly program, planning for success will be, unless something changes between now and then, Wednesday, October 28th, 2009, just before the election. Now, the Independent Party 
has nominated four candidates for the Board of Selectmen. So now altogether we have 15 candidates for the Board of Selectmen, five from the Democratic Party, five from the Republican Party, four from the Independent Party, and one petitioner who has petitioned and will be on the ballot. The Independent Party has endorsed one Republican, Mayor Kenneth J. Fricasso, for the Board of Selectmen. Mayor Fricasso has accepted their endorsement, a wise decision. They also had previously uh, cross-nominated a Democrat who has not served in uh, government here uh, at the selectman level in the past, and uh, he turned them down for various reasons, which I will discuss on future programs. I think Mr. Fricasso made a wise decision because he is open to talk to anybody at any time about any issue, and he will state his mind, tell what he thinks, and he won't say one thing, like others do, and mean another. You can count on him to give you an honest, truthful answer that he intends to stand behind. For technical reasons, with state statutes, the Indep Independent Party has not been able to nominate any candidates for the Board of Education or Town Clerk. I think they've learned a lesson there that will stand them good in two years when they run again. Let's hope they do. Now, as far as voters are concerned, I want to just remind you, we've talked about this for two years, but then it grows a little bit from time to time, but uh, unaffiliated voters are 3,700 or so. I haven't been able today to get the exact number because they're pretty busy down at the town hall, but it's about 53% of the voters in the town of Winchester. The Democrats have about 1,800, perhaps a few more, or 26% or so of the voters registered. Republican Party has 1,400 or so, or 20% or so, of the voters registered. And the minority parties all put together have about 50, plus or minus a few, or about 1%. So altogether, we have about 6,950 voters registered and about 100% here when you add it all up. Now, I think this number is a little over 700, uh, as I remember it from the last election, but I haven't been able to confirm it. If I get to confirm this week, I'll put it up again next week. Now, i also like to make a special <coughs> pardon me, plea to, to renters, renters in town. Uh, don't think that you don't have a stake in this election. You do have a stake in this election. Anybody who rents in the town and pays rent, if you don't pay rent, you won't be affected. But anybody who does pay rent should not be complacent. They should register to vote and vote as future tax increases will eventually cause future rent increases. The owners of the buildings that you rent from cannot keep having tax increases without eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually raising your rent. So pay attention, find out what's going on, and try to vote for people that are financially sound and will help protect you, as well as the financially sound people that want to bring in the additional profitable recurring revenue from the two major developments down the uh, uh, down the Enterprise Corridor between Winston and Torrington, and also get the water and sewer line in down there. That's going to be a big task, although it's on its way thanks to these uh, majority of these selectmen. And uh, then we can have more industry down there, and that's a very, very important thing for the town of Winchester. Ind industry pays very profitable recurring uh, tax, and it usually increases, as I showed you on a clip here a few weeks ago. Now, I also want to once again remind you, because these people are, some of them are running for office again, and some of them want to be mayor. And some that aren't on the list want to be mayor. But meeting attendance uh, of the administration to date, regular and special meetings, and by the way, the special meetings are not to be uh, uh, sloughed off. They're very often more important than the regular meetings. 
special meetings are. So it's very important to attend special meetings. Mayor Fracasso was only absent from one over the last almost two years, one meeting. Selectman Ham, three meetings. Selectman Liskin, five meetings he was absent from. That's both regular and special meetings. Uh, one, I, I'm sure one time he had a death in the family. I'm not sure about the others. Selectman Capabianca was uh, absent five times. Selectman Berlinski, five times. Selectman Renzullo, to the best of my count, was seven times. And Selectman Perez, who often isn't prepared when she does come to the meetings, missed 13 meetings. She's the GOAT here. She's the last in the list. And the two who have concerns about being mayor, Mayor Fracasso, who was absent once and attends many, many, many meetings over the weeks and months over the last two years, and Selectman Perez, who missed 13 meetings and often appears to have not have done her homework uh, and fumbles about a bit when she is in the meeting. So if I were going to pick a mayor from these two candidates, I would pick, hands down, Selectman for Caso. Marijuana. We're going to do the reprise of, Mar of marijuana tonight with some more information. As I said last week, cannabis, commonly known as marijuana, is a psychoactive drug that is illegal to possess, use, or sell in most of the United States. So, psychoactive, the word used in that definition, is a substance having a profound, profound, or significant, significant effect on mental processes. Now, this weekend, I was reading the New York Times, and I went through the book uh, review section, as I always do, in the Times itself, and there was an article called Reefer Madness. Reefer Madness. A British writer struggles with a teenage son ensnared by a potent form of marijuana by Dominique Browning. She's a reviewer of, the, of this book. The book is entitled, and you can probably get a copy from Borders. I'm going to buy a copy myself and put it in the Beardsley and Memorial Library so you can read it. Uh, it'll take a while to get it and get it in there, but I uh, will do that for the uh, town. And the book is entitled The Lost Child, A Mother's Story by Julie Meyerson. If you're a mother watching with your children, or if your children watching without your mother and father, pay attention to this, because this is serious stuff. It's dynamite for youngsters. This book uh, was reviewed in the Sunday New York Times book review this week. You can probably get it at the library. Page 10, August 30th, 2009. You probably find it online as well. Now, Julie Meyerson is a novelist living in London, England, and the mother of three children. She was finally forced to throw her eldest son out of the house, and boy, Englishmen don't like to do that, and change the locks when his cannabis habit so deranged him that he became physically violent. He was 17 years old. The mother says in her book, I am flattened, deadened. I have nothing in my mind except the deep black hole that is in the loss of my child, Myerson writes. There's a whole book about this. I can't do it all here in this brief little uh, hour, but uh, you should read the book if you're concerned about the schools, Drugs in the schools, drugs in the town, drugs in the uh, in your own family. The child smoked skunk, a strain of cannabis whose tetra cannabilol <laughs> it's a tough word, content is much more potent than garden variety pot. It's called THC, so you don't have to spell that big word that I couldn't even fit on one line. 
The book reviewer points out that even as stronger varieties of cannabis are being bred, medical research is linking cannabis use to behavioral and cognitive changes representative reminiscent of psychiatric disorders like and you've heard of most of these schizophrenia bipolar disorder major depression and anxiety disorder and yet says the reviewer we find ourselves arguing about whether pot is addictive or a gateway drug. Myerson is brutal in describing the heartbreaking varieties of hell through which she and her family are being dragged. They speak to a psychiatrist who explains that the potency of THC, that long word I showed you a few pages back, in skunk can do untold and irreversible damage. We will now show a reprise. We will show once again the selectman meeting where a Democratic selectman brought up the issue of cannabis, marijuana, at the selectman meeting in the town of Winchester two weeks ago. Uh, that a couple sure. times and, and when you were going through his uh, drug investigations. Yeah. Uh, what kind of drug investigations exactly? I mean, are we talking about heroin or are we talking about marijuana? No, we're talking about heroin and crack. Okay. Which both are a problem for us. Right, because I would just say right off, I mean, our our uh, state legislature overwhelmingly, I think there was maybe 13 legislators that voted not to decriminalize marijuana. Uh, Ma Massachusetts decriminalized marijuana. Um, I, I think that the only reason it's not currently decriminalized is because our governor uh, vetoed it. And uh, uh, I've, I'm personally, I lived in Colorado for 10 years. The citation out there is like, I think the, uh, it's like a $50 ticket. Um, and uh, I, I just hope we're not wasting any money on that. No, we, the last drug operation that we had, and I can put together the cases that we had, I think we made 10 arrests on it. Uh, we're all for heroin and, and crap. Right. And, uh, which is, you know, obviously you would... those investigations on the shoestring. I went to Keith, explained to him we didn't have the money for overtime. My officers agreed to do it for compensatory time. We went out, put investigations together. We shut down some places that were right near the church that were dealing with crack. Uh, there's people there that are still facing jail time. Uh, there was another place uh, down on Park Place, a crack house that we shut down. There was a person that was selling um, uh, Vicodin, getting prescriptions. <laughs> from his doctor on water green and installing the bike and up at uh, Island Point and he was arrested. Um, so we were, we were productive with, with the limited amount that we have and I need to continue to do that because you know you can't back off and, and, and stop your enforcement efforts. But we don't have the overtime money to do it. And I can't keep asking my officers to do it for compensatory time because eventually we pay overtime for that. So what I need is some assistance and the federal government's gonna give us that in a way of about ten thousand dollars in cash. No, I was just I was just curious because obviously there's a distinction between you know it's not marijuana like uh, that you know right which I our problems are a lot deeper than that Dave so I, I I guess this is a little off the off the the subject here but I, I guess I just want to be clear you're suggesting that the PD not bother would to enforce the existing marijuana laws in the state of Connecticut because you believe it should be legalized. I think that just uh, we're talking about overtime and that I, as it was listed down here uh, as far as investigations, contractual agreements, that was one of the things that he had listed. He, said, he cited uh, not continuing the D.A.R.E. program. Um, you know, I just I think there's obviously a distinction between things like heroin and cocaine and marijuana. That's what I'm saying. So, so you're saying he shouldn't? spend much time worrying about marijuana. I certainly wouldn't want a costly um, uh, investigation uh, to go and be wasting taxpayer dollars on that, no. Yeah. Wasting taxpayer dollars on drug violations. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. Now, and I'm kind of uh, disappointed by that uh, performance at that meeting. As I said last week, 
Um, we have a drug problem in this town, we know. I'm not so sure how serious it is. Some people think it's very serious. And that we also have a, a problem in, with drugs in the school system as well as the town. And uh, the policemen are trying to uh, attack this problem with education and with uh, arrests. And um, I don't think it's wise at all for the Democrats to be running a, a candidate who didn't do much in the last two years for re-election when he's professing that kind of amateur psychology in a selectman meeting where we should be talking about bitter, bigger and better things. So um, you will not get my vote, and I think you all should consider very seriously about he and his party in the next forthcoming election. Now I'm going to another subject, which is incremental recurring tax priorities for development. I think that's in the right place. Let me know if it's, uh, it's off a little. Incremental recurring tax priorities for development for the town of Winchester. We've had a couple of pieces of news uh, in the last uh, election, in the last uh, few weeks. I haven't been able to discuss them, but I will now. And uh, I want you to uh, pay attention here because I don't want you to be fooled by any of this progress uh, that we're having. So I kind of want to give you, first of all, a priority list of what I, Brian O'Haran, considers to be um, the major priority list for getting additional recurring taxpayer revenue profitably into the town of Winchester to help us with our wants and needs and take some of this burden off the state and off the existing taxpayers. We may not have any choice on that over the next few years, so we better be paying close attention to it and not worrying about marijuana arrests. Number one, my view is that the major, after much study over five years here and attending a lot of meetings in the town of all sorts, including almost all of the first major development meetings with the land use boards, the major age-restricted housing projects are our best alternative and will be for the foreseeable future despite the recession. Recession will end someday. The, uh, the uh, retiring baby boomers will be coming this way someday. They will be selling their houses and apartments for more money, much more money, in other states than they will be paying for these age-restricted housing projects with a large golf course in our town between in the northeast uh, corridor between Winston and Torrington. Once they're up and running, there'll be about eight or 900 more people most of them will be age-restricted. They won't have any children in there to attend our schools. Number two, by the way, we're talking here in the multi-millions, between five and ten million, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending upon the, uh, what happens in the world over the next ten years and what happens in the United States, Connecticut, and Winston. Number two, major shopping centers. Our biggest taxpayer in town right now is the major shopping center, Stop and Shop, is located in. They pay more taxes, about $300,000 a year in taxes, and they don't place many demands upon the town. So that's what we call profitable tax revenue. They don't have children to go into the school system. They don't have a large family to cost the town $662 apiece to maintain. So they pay us some nice, re uh, uh, profitable tax money. Number three in priority would be major industrial manufacturing, like Howmet, and formerly, until they ran into some financial trouble recently, which they may get out of over time as they have a new owner, Homer D. Bronson. They were in the top ten list in, the, in 2006 when uh, the bond issue was done for the roads and things. So we need more industrial manufacturing, and I showed you a clip a few weeks back from the EDC program where um, they, uh, John Marisi and Bill Pratt were talking to two people from the state, and they said that's the best bet in the long run where you don't have the luck of a new major age-restricted housing project coming, knocking on your door begging to come to town. You need to get these industrial manufacturing things because you can only get so many shopping centers but you can get a lot more industrial manufacturing 
in in the town um, of all sorts, uh, and they can add quite a bit. I think two or three of our top ten taxpayers are major industrial manufacturing. One is this housing project, uh, major major. I'm sorry, not that the major shopping center, and uh, the next one is multi-million dollar houses and the states. Are we talking about $5 million house at the lake or a $4 million or a $3 million house uh, at, uh, in the town of Winchester? And with few children in those houses, they have very, very profitable tax um, for us every year, up around forty to $45,000 a year. And it doesn't cost the town much because a lot of them are summer residents. They don't even have children in the school system, and they're not here to use the facilities of the town, roads, et cetera, most of the year. Now, there are some exceptions to that. But anyway, that's a real boon for the town, but there aren't that many of those. So, but there are three in the top ten, the two of them in Winchester and one at Island Lake, uh, taxpayer list. And then apartments with minimal children. That's one of the things I want to point out. I'm not against children. We've got three children and four grandchildren. We're not against children. We'd like to see children but they must be balanced by other things that bring in more money to help pay for the children. Now, I haven't put on the list here apartments that everybody has four kids in every apartment because we're losing our shirt on that. So we need more people up in this range, especially this major age-restricted housing project. Uh, and my view on that is very simple. You'll find all kinds of reasons why the Democratic Party and their supporters say you should not get these people. We don't like their developers. We don't like this. We don't like that. They'll ruin the environment. Well, in the meetings we had with the Inland Wetlands and with the uh, Planning and Zoning, they uh, aren't going to ruin any environment to the best of my knowledge. Nobody could prove anything in that area. And a developer, well, that's another issue. If they don't like the developer, then they should get with the town leaders, and they should get with the developer, and they should try to uh, continue with the project to get all this money into our town between 5 and $10 million, and and perhaps have the developer sell it to somebody else. Now, the developer has always said that he was going to get the permits, get organized, and sell most of the development off to professional developers. I still think he thinks that way, although I don't know. I haven't talked to him. But what we need to do is take a positive approach to this whole thing, just like we take a positive approach to all these other things we do here. And uh, we make it hard on a lot of these people to come to our town, almost impossible. And we do drive a lot of people away because it's hard to get major industrial manufacturing when your test scores aren't up to speed. People don't want to come to a town that uh, their test scores aren't up to speed. That's more important than cleaning up Main Street, in my opinion, is getting those, techs, those uh, industrial uh, uh, the test scores up so we can attract people with their children to come into our town. Um, all the rest is important, too. I'm just talk trying to set some priorities here for that. Now, I'm going to talk about some numbers tonight, so again refer to the Harold Michalowski report submitted to the Inland Wetlands and P&Z for the Highland Ridge and St. Anne's Country Club project. At that time, I think it was called Aurora or something, but uh, it's up there in the P&Z office. It's in my green papers in the town clerk's office of uh, 2006, and it's in the, uh, it's in the Inland Wetlands office. You can get a copy and read it, but they did a study of the town and in there they came up with some numbers that I've been using for lack of uh, better information um, on these uh, sort of rough sketches I'm giving you. So we're going to talk tonight about some continuing development possibilities for smaller housing projects. And the first one uh, I want to talk, uh, talk about, before I talk about those, I want to tell you that there is, th these, these things aren't going to bring us much financial help. They're going to be a boon to the sh uh, shop holder owners. They're going to be a boon to all the businesses, gas stations. They'll be a boon to the stop and shop and the IGA store. They'll be a boon to uh, the cinema. They'll be a boon to the restaurants. They'll be very good for all that thing. But as far as paying and helping us with our additional recurring profitable revenue, they are not going to help us that much. And I'll give you a rough idea. Uh, here tonight. Why? But anyway, I want you to first start out by saying that there's positives to these things, of course. They're way down on the priority list that I showed you, but they're very important. 
and uh, the ancillary effects are very important. I don't have all of them here, but just a couple to give you an idea. They'll bring people to all the retails, to the uh, Wall of America, to the Nader Museum once it opens down there, and to any other thing like that uh, in our town. And that will bring money to our town. It'll be spent in our town, and uh, there'll be a lot of people to this corridor that the town wants to make to the Berkshires. So it's good in that respect. Nobody would argue with that. And it helped to provide more pleasant surroundings. It would be nice not to see some of these old buildings. And I'm told that the developer that wants to come and do the Mad River Mill rental apartments has done some excellent work in Hartford that you can all see by going down there and looking at it and uh, in other places. So I'll, let's make it very clear before somebody uh, criticizes me in the newspapers or somewhere else saying that we're not in favor of these. We are in favor of them. The whole town is in favor of them. The town leadership is in favor of them as they stand today. Might not be the same in a, in a year or two because like Lambert Kay, there are several very important issues that go along with getting these people to do business in our town. The first one I want to talk about, and you'll see I hope a picture of the Mad River Mill Rental Apartment proposal that's been made to the town. You can get a copy from Planning and Zoning or the town uh, manager, and I, I think it's on the Planning and Zoning uh, website if you know how to use that. If not, call up there and ask them how to use it or have them run you a copy. But you can get a copy of this proposal. Tonight I'll give you a small summary of that from a financial viewpoint. The proposal is to convert the old New England knitting mill at 10 Bridge Street into an apartment complex, and it has been received from a Hartford developer, Lexington Partners LLC, about the 20th of August, 20th of August, we received that. The initial plan calls for 64 apartment units with 78 parking spaces to the rear. The units would be, as envisioned now, and all these things change over time, the units would be a mix of six studios, say artist studios or sculpture studios or whatever, one bedroom, uh, 34 one-bedroom apartments uh, and 24 two-bedroom uh, apartments, ranging from 495 square feet, not too big, to 1,200 square feet. It's about the same size as most the, the first floor of most people's uh, uh, homes. There will be patios facing the river, much like it was at Lambert K, and additional amenities, including a fitness center, outdoor grills, a laundry room, a recycling center, bike racks, and storage rooms. The goal is to attract students at the nearby community college, recent graduates, people who work in town, and young families. Young families, Julie, means children in the school system. The developer estimates that construction, including environmental remediation, demolition, site work, and interior finishes will take about 15 months to complete and cost about $10 million. Now, that doesn't mean 15 months from now. That means 15 months from when everything is ready to go. That could be a year or two from now. So it's uh, very important that you, you realize that this is a long way off. It's not going to happen in 15 months. But that's what he thinks it'll take to finish once he's given all the OKs, has all the money pulled together, etc. Based, uh, based upon current capitalization rates, a fair market value of development would be about, and this comes from the developer, $6.2 million. That would leave the project short about $3.8 million of what the developer needs to break even. So somewhere between the town, the state, the federal government, and the developer himself, we have to figure out a way to come up with $3.8 million to get this off the ground and to get it through the land use boards, etc. The developer says that if the economy were better, Tax credits could would be the first logical step to bridge the cap, gap, but the economy is not better. So other types of financing will have to be pursued, and this is what will take the time and uh, the agita, uh, etc. One one possibility is a 10-year phase-in of taxes, tax abatements, 
or tax increment financing. In that particular case, we wouldn't be getting the tax money until, you know, we get a little by little over the 10 years, and there is a schedule for it in his plan um, to come to the town. And then federal stimulus money is an option, brownfield grants, and then the developer says that he has recently completed similar projects, such as $40 million for Trumbull on the Park apartment and retail building in downtown Hartford. Everybody tells me it's a terrific place. You ought to go down and look at it sometime when you're going to Hartford. And the Addison Mill, uh, $12 million Addison Mill project in Glastonbury. That's also sp supposed to be first class. So this guy's done a couple first class ones and appears to be, although you never know until everybody uh, scrutinizes this whole thing, a responsible developer. I'll assume he is until proven differently. The town leaders are supporting the project to date. The mayor, the town manager, the EDC, uh, they haven't talked to the land use board yet, but anyway, everybody they talk to seems pretty, pretty positive about this, even though we all know it's not the financial answer to our current problems. The developer does not intend to file an application with local land use boards until he meets with the town officials to determine how much support they can offer. A very smart man. First, he should make sure the whole town is in back of him before he spends a lot of money trying to raise that $3.8 million and uh, put all this. It all costs money. got to hire engineers. you got to hire salesmen. you got to hire all kinds of things. So this is a very smart man. The last person who tried that, the developer for the major projects, did the same thing. He came to the town. He got the town support. The town encouraged him to build a golf course. And then when he started going through the land use boards, um, he began to get mixed signals, and he began to get some uh, group from the Highland Lake, uh, uh, east side of the lake, uh, retarding his progress and giving him a hard time. And some of those were members uh, east and west side of the Democratic Party. Most of them were. Most other town leaders were in favor all the way up to now of these developments between Winston and Torrington. Now, how about taxes? Well, he says the fair market value is 6200000 once he gets it all cleaned up and fixed, it'll be worth about six million two hundred thousand. So we'll have to multiply that by seventy percent to see what the assessed value will be for tax purposes, and that'll be about four million three hundred and forty thousand or so, give or take. And then it depends on abatements, it depends on a lot of things. But basically, I'm just saying uh, uh, when it's all done and it's ready, and uh, it'll be worth about uh, four million three forty thousand. Then we have to multiply by the mill rate. The mill rate may be different then, but for example now, I use the current mill rate, 24.67 percent. That's the way it's represented in mathematics, and then uh, that equals $107,068 in taxes for the town. Now, what are the approximate costs to the town if this thing happens the way that's it's planned? The uh, approximate costs are from the Harold Michalowski report, it costs about $662, give or take, uh, uh, maybe a little less now, maybe a little more, for us to maintain every resident in this town. For me and you, it costs $662 to keep the streets plowed, to keep the streets in shape, to keep uh, all that kind of thing done for uh, the city hall in shape, the town hall rather, and all those buildings and everything else. So it's, that'll take about 92680 of the money that comes from there. And I've used a, a figure of 24 children of K through 12 school age. Uh, uh, would be in there, and that was that's about half. So uh, of the uh, studios and apartments that'll be there, you multiply that by fifteen thousand, and that equals three hundred and sixty thousand. So the total rough cost will be four hundred and fifty-two thousand six hundred eighty. And the money coming in at peak when everything's fixed, I said before, is one hundred seven thousand sixty-eight. So this is a loss for the town financially. Great boom for the town. For people coming, spending money, cleaning up old buildings, but as far as our recurring, residential, profitable uh, tax is concerned, not much help. Plus, you may not get all of the taxes for the 10 years if local abatement is given. Now, I want to point out there are many studies in the real estate business, in the town business, and all that, that say that these kind of things don't really bring you a lot of financial uh, help. They'll bring you a lot of what I talked about, a lot of people coming, they'll help everybody, but as far as tax help is concerned, 
there won't be uh, any boon from this. This is an also ran in that category. Wonderful for many other reasons, but not for helping us increase the uh, recurring profitable residential tax base. Now there's another development that has just been approved. I'm only going to talk about two tonight, and this is the second one. Uh, I saw it in the papers. I haven't looked into it too much. I did talk down to the town planner about it to make sure I was in the right ballpark here. But a 45-unit uh, uh, condominium apartment complex in nine buildings off of Nanny Drive and Mountain View Terrace in the northeast corner of town has recently been approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now, the Planning and Zoning Commission, to the best of my knowledge, won't approve anything unless it's already been approved by the Inland Wetlands Commission, so most likely been approved there as well. The plans call for mainly two-bedroom townhouse and ranch-style buildings on nearly 19 acres of wooded property not far from the Litchfield Garden Apartments, and that's up on uh, uh, North Main Street. A spokesman for the developers estimated that the price range of each unit will range between $190,000 and $210,000. It will take two years or more, once begun, to finish the project depending upon the, how the real estate market is. And often these developers used to like to have houses sold before they build them. And they like to have so many sold before they begin to build so they can build at least some sort of quantity at one time. Construction may and should, could begin in the spring according to the developer. Now, how about taxes? 45 units times 200,000 to equals, I used the, I rounded off 195 to 210 or whatever it was to 200,000 and uh, I multiply that by 45 and you get nine million dollars. Sounds like a big number. Nine million dollars in, uh, in, uh, in appraised value. But now you have to multiply that by 70 percent, if I'm doing it correctly, I'm pretty sure I am, to get to the, uh, the value that we charge taxes on. And so when you multiply by 7 percent, that nine million drops down to six million three hundred thousand dollars, and then you take the six million three hundred thousand and you multiply by the current uh, uh, mill rate, twenty-four point six seven. You get one hundred fifty-five thousand four hundred and seventy-one dollars. The total taxes then we will get from this forty-five unit. Uh, uh, Condo development is a hundred and fifty-five thousand four hundred and twenty-one dollars approximately. It will fluctuate over time, depending upon a lot of things, and uh, maybe even off a little here now, but not much. I'm just trying to make a point. Now, I'm assuming that there'll be two residents in each of the forty-five units, and uh, so that means ninety residents. So at six sixty-two a person to support them as a town. We will take from that tax money $59,580 to support the people that live in the building. If one K-8 student per unit exists, and it may not be, that would cost $15,000, and that would equal minus $675,000 that we would need from the tax money to educate those children in that complex. Now, they could be less than that, but we're going to have plenty of room to spare here. I can tell you that. We'll still be at a loss. So the co total cost of the town is 155421 That's a revenue coming in, minus 59580 for the 662 per resident, and uh, 675, minus 675000 for educating the children, if indeed there are as many as as I've estimated here, and that's purely my estimate, not the uh, developers. So that's a uh, minus 579,159. So there could be a loss to the town of about $579,159. And um, 
And it could be a lot less if there aren't that many children in town. But I'm trying to make a point here. I don't think it's going to be profitable, either of these, for the town as far as that's concerned. There will be more people here. Some of them will be able to work in the factories, work in the stores. Same with the other development. We've got a whole mixture of things here. But as far as additional, incremental, recurring, profitable taxes to help us offset our problems, this isn't going to be much help at all. That's why we need those major developments. We ought to all get behind it. If you're, uh, if you're part of the good half of the Democratic Party that believes in this, let's please get out and talk to your other fellow Democratic Party members. But if I were you, 3,700 unaffiliated voters and 1,400 Republican voters, I wouldn't rely on Democratic votes to get these developments into town. You'll get a few, of course. I would count on getting out the vote and getting these renters out the vote and vote in favor of these, uh, these group that has been pushing these developments and it's almost everybody in town except the Democratic Party. So I'm trying to put this thing in perspective for you tonight. There's still time to do something about it before the election. Do as much as you can to talk to as many people and encourage as many people. And uh, remember now the story I told at the beginning of the program. Somebody will always find a reason to make things uncomfortable and to have people fail when they have an ultimate reason for not wanting these developments in town. If there was a rare skunk up there, they'd find it. If there was an Indian buried up there somewhere and they could get out on that escape, they would find it. I know they've been looking for it. So let's go. Let's get together. Let's make it all happen. Let's get the people in here that already believe in getting this town uh, managed properly. Let's not get people in that want to raise our taxes and do a little to bring in this additional profitable recurring revenue to our town for its coffers. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>